Hi, I'm Oscar Hagen and welcome to Pushing Exile to its Limit with Dynamic Arrays. This is just a short session about a silly little project I've undertaken that ended up really pushing some of the limits with Excel. So I'm a senior analyst with some product specializing in project finance and audits. Oh, what's that? How did I get there? Oh, that's the book I co-wrote with Liam Bastic about financial modeling for project finance. That's embarrassing. But I'm serious now, I'm bringing up this book here because there's actually another one that's relevant financial modeling using dynamic arrays. Now I promise you, I'm not just trying to shamelessly plug these books. This one's really relevant. So for this book, Liam, with the help of the very talented Talia, built a financial model using dynamic arrays. I'll get in trouble if I spill all of the secrets here, but let's take a quick look at that model to give you some context before I show you the monstrosity that I've created. So this is the final version of the case study model that's built in the book. There's nothing too special about the first few sheets, certainly the things all good models should have. So we've got the, the cover sheet telling you, hey, here's who made the model, here's what it's for, and here's how you can get in contact with them if you find any issues. There's the navigator sheet, which is just full of hyperlinks to make navigating the model a bit easier. The style guide, hey, here are the styles we used and what each one of them means. We've got the model parameters, um, things that we expect to stay constant throughout the model, you know, here's, we're always assuming there are 365 days in the standard year and so on. I won't be going through things in much detail here. Just a quick overview of some of the key features of this uh, model, uh, establishing good context for what I've done. So where things actually start to differ a little is with the assumptions. So the whole idea of this model is that it's, you know, it uses dynamic arrays so that we can change the number of periods covered by the calculations of the model really easily. And for that, we need to make sure that there's assumptions for the right number of periods. I'll highlight the purchases and related section here, because this is where we have assumptions brought in a few different ways. And we have to consider this on the calculation sheet when we're bringing these assumptions in. So first for the purchases, this is these are brought in a pretty standard way. Someone types these in for the periods. We've got the price. Here we use a, uh, a formula that will um, spill depending on how many periods there are. So we'll bring in these five different numbers if there's five periods and more if we have more. Um, for things like the amount used per sale, where we're keeping that constant to two, we just need to make sure we bring in the number two, but for the right number of periods. Let me demonstrate this by jumping ahead to the timing sheet and changing the number of periods, let's just say from five to, let's go for eight, why not? If I go back to the general assumption sheet, you see now purchases has numbers for eight periods. That's a bit odd because they're all typed in. We have cheated a little here. There are actually numbers all the way up to uh, the 20th period. That's where we cut it off for this example. But we've used a mixture of conditional formatting and some number formatting to hide these when they're not required. For the price, as you've seen, this will spill in line with the J9 hash, that's just saying take this entire spilled range, which will actually increase or decrease in size, depending on the number of periods we've input and bring in the right number of assumptions. And it's the same for amount used in sale. So I'm gonna take the time back down to five periods and take a look at how we put these into the calculations. So we get back down to five, if we head to the calculation sheet and let's jump down to purchases and related since those are the assumptions we were looking at. And we'll shrink down the formula half an hour. So you see in purchases and related, we bring the purchases first. Now remember, these were the hard-coded numbers. So we can't just link to the, uh, the spilled range and use the hash operator because this isn't actually spilling, but we need this bit too. So we've made use of the offset function and we just say start in J41. That's where the assumption is, J41 here. And just take a range with a width equal to the number of periods. So if it's set to five, bring in the first five, if it's set to eight, bring in the first eight, and so on. For other things like the price, it's pretty simple. We can just use the, uh, the hash at the end there. So start in J42 and take the entire spilled range because those assumptions are already spilling. So if I unhide these columns, just change these assumptions again quickly on the timing sheet, you'll see how if we set it to eight again, this now has eight lots of assumptions brought in and there's nothing coming through here despite there being more on the assumption sheet for purchases. So there's a couple of other calculations I want to highlight here. I'm just going to put the timing back to five 
and then we'll run through some of the other calculations because some of these are things I had to bear in mind what I created. The things like bringing the purchases in here again, that's nothing getting too complicated, is it? Just saying bring in the purchases again, bring in the price again, and then for the purchases in US dollars thousands, multiply them together and divide by a thousand. It doesn't get too scary here until we go down to the control account. So here, bringing the purchases again, nice and easy, straight from here. The cash payments, that's just a balancing figure between these three. And the closing payables is something we calculated here, so we can just link to that. Now the opening balance is where things start to getting a little hard with these calculations. Normally, what I would do is I would say, okay, so in June 25, the opening balance is just going to be equal to the previous period's closing balance. And we'd be able to copy that across. Any of these cells were formatted as numbers so we could see them. You can see that's giving us our opening balances. Unfortunately, this isn't dynamic, is it? This isn't a dynamic array. I've had to drag that across. You saw me do it. So if I remove that, you can see what we've actually had to do here is say start in J91, take that whole range, but just shift everything one column to the left. And that has worked here. Now, I've said this is one of the more complicated formula. I might be omitting some things. For example, if we go down to the tax depreciation section and take a look at the tax depreciation calculations here and here, if you can tell me what those do already at a glance like this, then you're a better modeler than me. And that's before I've even mentioned this horror maximum dividend payable calculation here. To scroll with my formula bar this big to see it still. There we go. So you may notice this model is pretty powerful. The timing can be varied and everything will update accordingly as I showed you. So we can choose something like 20. And you'll see we've got calculations for all 20 periods and it's putting through to the financial statement. So we've got our report the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. And it's all working despite having less formula than a typical Excel model because the formula actually only in column J. If I go to column K here, you'll see I can't edit this formula. The formula is in column J and it just spills accordingly. So despite having less formula in it than a typical Excel model, it's kind of more powerful. So there I was looking at this model and some of the horrific formula in it in the tax depreciation section and the dividend section. And I thought, hang on. I could make this even more horrible. Right now, the, the model's only got formula in column J, and they're spilling across. But dynamic arrays can spill down and across. Couldn't we build this all in one formula? Oh, okay. So now I'm hesitant to show you the abomination I've created here. Um, but let's get out of the way. Of course, this isn't how I'd recommend building a model ever. This is hard to follow. The formula is disgusting, and well, the formula singular is disgusting. <laughs> and you know, there's the classic uh, Leibniz rule of thumb. He says you know, a formula shouldn't be longer than your thumb. I think this formula here is uh, probably longer than the thumb of anyone who's watching this. And if not, I'm just concerned for you. So welcome to the one cell model, as I've called it. Now, yes, you might see I've got three sheets of calculations and all three uh, financial statements in here, but that's just to split out the calculations in a way that we can actually follow here and avoid some of the limitations of Excel that are crushing my dreams, which is also why I've had to shorten the names of some of these sheets from general assumptions to assume and from opening balance sheet to OBS. Um, so, of course, you know, this, I've had to do a few workarounds to even get this working here, and yeah, I could have there would have been shorter ways to write this, this formula too. But this is just a demonstration of what could be possible. So we'll start at the beginning again. There's nothing new about these first three sheets. The cover sheet says what it is and contact details. The navigator's got the hyperlinks to get around the model. The style guide has our styles and what they mean. Model parameters, the parameters in there and the assumptions is also untouched. Where things start getting different, is with the calculations. It looks the same though, doesn't it? But it's not. If I click here, you'll see this rectangle showing you where the uh, formula is. It's actually just here and it's spilled down the entire sheet. So how have I done this? 
I won't go through the entire formula here. I don't think we've got time for that. So first of all, let's uh, well, let's just expand this down and take a look. We have a let function, and this just defines pretty much each line in the model. We've got our counter, sequence one, number of periods, and that ends up being this line here. We've got our end date, which ends up being this line here, and this line here. Our start date, which is this line, and a number of days, which is this line, and so on and so forth. Every line of the model is defined in this let function, and the calculation for it is performed right here. Then way down at the bottom, we have this long, long v stat function, which just says we found the end date here, then the start date, then the end date again, then we want the number of days, we want the counter, and then we've got these blanks. And that's just how I've uh, left the buffers between the calculations, the gaps that we have in the current layout of the model. So some of the things we looked at before was the opening balances and how it could be hard to bring those in with dynamic arrays, and we had to use the offset function. Of course, I don't have that luxury here because I've not already bought in the closing balances anywhere. And it's all calculated within the, this one formula. I can't just say, hey, take this range and shift it one column to the left. It does not work like that. So if we go down to an opening balance calculation, <laughs> bit of scrolling in here, you see two things. First, we've got op val. So this is all for the uh, revenue receivables opening balance right here. So opval is actually a custom function I've defined within the let function here. So it has um, two arguments. The first is the opening balance. So that's the initial balance from the opening balance sheet. And then the array containing all the closing balances. So what it does is it looks at the counter, which is, you know, we've defined it earlier. And we've returned it here so you can see what it's doing here. If it, the counter is equal to one, so it's the first period, we just want to return the opening balance from the opening balance sheet. Otherwise, we want to look at our array of closing balances and index it by the counter minus one. So that means in the second period, the opening balance is going to be equal to two minus one, the first period's closing balance. So there we go, that works. And you'll see, you know, rev opening receivables, which ends up being this line here. It just says, do the opval function. So uh, in period one, we return OBS I15, which is the opening balance sheet I15, which is this number here, we put it in so you can see it. It's the opening balance for receivables. Otherwise, look at rev receivables, which is our receivables closing balance here. Or as you can see the calculation for it here. And just take the previous period's closing balance. Nice and easy. Four things like the uh, assumptions we had to bring in a tricky way before. So let's see if I can find purposes in here. <laughs> you see, this is like I say, it's not. This is not how a model should be built. I'm trying to look at one particular calculation in here, and I have to scroll through Excel's formula bar to try and find it. But here we are, purchases kg. So if I scroll here as well, so you can see it, that is just these. We can use the offset function here and bring them in the same way that's actually done in the case study model that I was showing you, because I'm referring to something that does exist somewhere outside of this formula. So as you've seen, the way I'm returning the calculations is with this V stack at the bottom. So I've defined each of these end date, start date, gross profit, cost of goods sold, uh, purchases in dollars, thousands, and they're calculated above in this let function and then just returned and stacked in an order that's sensible to make the calculations easy to follow. And there are some other ways to do this, which we'll look at in a second. Just quickly, you'll see I've got my uh, calculations here. And if I shrink that down so we can actually see the uh, calculations you'll see here, it goes all the way down to death and related. And then I hit the Excel uh, formula length limit because of that long V stack at the end. So I've still managed to build a formula with all of the calculations in M1, but I've had to split out where I've reported them here to fit Excel's uh, formula length limit. So then we've got our tax calculations here. And again, it's one formula spilling down. And this has to refer to things that are calculated on this sheet. But I don't have to refer to the calculation sheet because they're still calculated within this formula. I've not dropped anything from it. So it still starts with the counter and it still has the projected sales unit price, even though that's not reported here. I bought it in because I'm calculating everything in one formula. So I can just return, return the net profit before tax here using all the things earlier. And just to demonstrate this in a quick aside, if we go back to the uh, case study dynamic array model, you'll see, you know, the income statement, for example, that links back to the calculation sheet. Meaning if I were to 
delete the calculation sheet here. We'll get errors, we'll get um, ref errors flowing through our model, figures will disappear. There's calculations that need to be done that are no longer being done. However, if we jump back to uh, the one cell model that we're looking at, if I just quickly jump ahead to the income statement, for example, you'll see the figures are there. But I can delete all of these calculation sheets. And you see the figures are still there because they're being calculated within this one formula. Okay, back to what I was saying before. And that's the point here. Everything can be calculated within one formula. And then we can just report on what we need. So for the income statement, we're still calculating everything. We're just only returning the revenue, the COGS, the gross profit, and so on and so on. And there's a, a few ways we can do this. You can see on the calculation sheet, I defined everything and then reported them there. But for example, what I could have done is, I'll just extend this a bit and scroll down to our stack at the bottom. <laughs> there we go. Sometimes even the scroll bar doesn't work, but it's like that. I've made this so long. You see, um, instead of naming things like, you know, gross profit, I can do the calculation. So here we've got revenue minus cost minus inventory cost, this is, and that gives us our gross profit. So it's just to show you there's a few approaches here. And I've tried to demonstrate um, a couple of different ways I could have done things. And we see on the cash flow statement, I've done it similarly to how I did with the calculations in that if I go down to the uh, V stack at the bottom, I define things. I've got my direct cash payments, which is this line here. I've got my I've got my net cash, which is reported right here, the net increase or decrease in cash held. And that's my operating cash flows minus the capex plus the financing cash flows. And this one needs to carry forward still. So for the balance sheet, I've had to keep all the calculations in here because I need to know the net increase or decrease in cash held so that I can report cash on the balance sheet. So you'll see all the calculations, no matter what sheet we're looking at, this st the start of the formula here is the same, besides some changes I may have had to make, like here, I can rename the blanks to X so that I could uh, just about fit everything in here with the uh, formula length limit. But all the calculations are in here, and then we just report on the things we need on each sheet, and we can even still do error checks. So you You'll notice we normally have our overall error check here. Instead, I've got a named range that looks at all of these and checks these. And that's what this check on each sheet refers to. And just to prove it to you, if I go to the timing sheet and increase this all the way up to 20 and unhide the columns, you'll see this still works. We have a financial model where everything is calculated in one formula. It makes it nice and easy for the auditors They've only got one thing to check. So I've been Oscar Hagen. I still am. I just have been too. And that was pushing Excel to its limit with dynamic arrays. The biggest limit for me there being the, uh, the maximum formula length. Um, but I hope you enjoyed my quick demonstration of what I've made and that it's inspired you to maybe make some ridiculous things in Excel and just see what it can do. If you want to leave any feedback here, you can use the QR code on the screen now. And also, just to let you know, the Microsoft Excel team is seeking research participants, so if you want to take part in that, you can use this QR code here. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation as well as the rest of Excel Virtually Global 2024.